Hello, friends. On this glorious day in drink history, my guest is author Dan Dunn. And as such, we're going full gonzo, beginning with a quote from the good Dr. Hunter S. Thompson. Quote, I find that by putting things in writing, I can understand them and see them a little more objectively. For words are merely tools. And if you use the right ones, you can actually put even your life in order. If you don't lie to yourself and use the wrong words. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I believe Mr. Dunn has indeed used the right words to process the tragic death of his younger brother and respond to a lifetime of accumulated family dysfunction with a hefty side order of heartbreak. Yes, he addressed these things head on, doing what any red-blooded American would do under those circumstances by embarking on a national tour of the United States of wine production with aspirations of becoming the leading expert on American wine. And in this book, he has put his journey, his insecurities, his failures, his sadness, and most importantly, his inspirations and insights in writing, while providing the rarest of rare glimpses into what beverage culture really is at its core, and that is the people that bring it to life. Not marketing, not tasting notes, not flashy advertising, it's people. And he captures these people in a way that is stunningly beautiful and refreshingly candid and honest. Now... This book is called American Wino, and its premise is focused on wine. And this is the educational drinking show where we talk all things spirits and cocktails. So why is this relevant? Because, ladies and gentlemen, Dan Dunn is one of the most influential and important spirits and cocktail writers and personalities of the last 20 years. You may know his work from the Playboy magazine column, The Imbiber, or his Sirius XM satellite radio program, Dan Dunn's Happy Hour, or his wildly popular column in Mutineer magazine, or his previous books, Nobody Likes a Quitter and Living Loaded, or his appearance on Conan and other mainstream shows, or if you spent any time in the world of spirits and cocktails, you've probably crossed paths with him. Because folks, he isn't just phoning this stuff in, no sir. He has long been in the trenches experiencing the spectacle of drink culture from deep within the belly of the beast. Clearly, I'm a fan. And as your self-proclaimed attorney of everything amazing about drinking, I can't recommend this new book, American Wino, enough, because it really is something special. Let's do this. This episode of the Educational Drinking Show is sponsored by Junipero Gin, which is the original American craft gin going back to 1996 and the pioneering work of Fritz Maytag, which also makes it the gin of San Francisco. In 98.6 proof, Junipero is a bit stronger than most gins and perfect in your favorite gin cocktail. Good stuff. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to share with you my interview with Dan Dunn. You know, the book uh, is about a journey that I took around the country. Yep. Uh, back in 2014, I drove for about three and a half months, 15,000 miles, and the end of it, I w the idea was to become the leading expert on wine in America, and at the end, I would do a seminar mm -hmm. at Pebble Beach Food and Wine as the leading expert, and I did that two years or a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and it was called American Wino. And it was a smashing success. Uh, so we went back again this year and we did another one called American Wine 02. This time it's personal and the book <laughs> and the book was finished. So that was where we launched the book. And, and I read a couple of bits and pieces at, at the event, including uh, uh, a part about, you know, the book deals a lot with my, my brother, my younger brother who died a couple of years ago. And, and I read a little bit about when I, I took his ashes with me on the trip in a mason jar. And I read a bit about when we were at Buddy Holly's grave mm -hmm. in um, in Lubbock, Texas. And then I looked up when I got done reading and, you know, half the room was crying. Oh. And I thought, all right, my work's done here. I've done it. Now let's have some drinks. So it went great there. And then we went to New York and Philadelphia and L.A. And now we're here in Vegas and we're going to see you soon in San Francisco. Yep. And yeah, it's good times, man. I have to say, uh, if you have a sibling, specifically a brother, specifically a younger brother. This is kind don't, of a, don't let him jump off the Venice pier. It's yeah, a tough book to read. 
It, it, is. it, it really it's is. It's tougher to write. <laughs> I, I imagine. Yeah. And as you know, my brother's name is Brian. Yes. So it was a little, um, a little eerie to read it. Yeah, that was a, uh, you know, I wish that that wasn't part of the book, but um, he jumped off the Venice Pier screwing around in 2010 and got caught in a riptide, and that was the end of it. But, uh, you know, the trip was really uh, important for me to take it, to take him with me and, mm -hmm. and sort of process all these feelings that I had about it. And I think take that and then you put it in the context of there, need to, there needed to be something beyond I'm just going to go out and, and ponder uh, my loss or uh, things that have happened. So having a goal, which was to go to these wineries from, you know, I started in, in Northern California and then we went through Oregon and Washington and big sky country and ended up all the way to the East Coast, you know, Portland, Maine and down the Eastern seaboard and then back through the South. And at each stop along the way that, you know, the, the mission was to go to wineries and meet people you know, who's making wine in Nebraska? Who's mm -hmm. making wine in Shelburne, Vermont? Who's making wine in North Georgia? Mm -hmm. And having that goal helped. It wasn't like I was just took off and was going on a pity trip, you know. So having that that thing, and, and even Pebble Beach especially, was, was really important. And it wasn't until I started to write the book mm -hmm. that I realized that it was really about but it was essentially it's a road trip, a, a buddy, buddy, yeah, a buddy book. Me and me and Brian on the road, uh, uh, having a good time, which we did. It seems like a very unique vehicle for working through something like that, to have that happen to you, and then write a book about American wine as a way of kind of processing that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the beauty of it too, we live in polarized times, as you know, and. Uh, I went to a lot of places along the way where I would assume that my uh, we probably don't agree on much uh, politically or uh, our views on religion and, and marriage and everything else probably differed, you know, when I was especially when I was in places like Texas and and Wyoming and Montana. But wine was the through line and everybody that I met had a passion for wine and that was that unified us. So mm -hmm. I didn't feel any of that. Now I'm Granted, had I gone down the block uh, from the winery that I visited in, in Bush, Louisiana, and started saying, hey, man, there's the Cabernet here. <laughs> Maybe not made it out of there. But um, uh, it, it really gave me, a, at the risk of sounding trite, it, 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 I saw the best of the country. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think it's important now because there are forces, very powerful forces out there whose mission for various reasons is uh, to divide us and, mm -hmm. to, and to point out all the things that are different. And I'm hoping that uh, that changes because I got to see a lot of the, uh, the real the good stuff along mm -hmm. the way and the things that we did have in common. And um, that was nice. Yeah. Yeah. I just got through. I'm have some of this beer now. Please do. Way. Delicious anchor. I've never had this, man. I've never had. The, I've had the anchor. The anchor regular anchor. Uh, the anchor steam. The anchor steam. But this lager. This is new-ish. Like the last two years, it's delicious. Mm. So easy to drink. And it gets you drunk. Let's slip uh, them down. Yeah, no, I like it. I just, uh, I just made it through the uh, Montana chapter, uh, and I loved how you, you didn't really pander to the wine but you still maintained empathy for the wineries there. It's oh, a very yeah. narrow line that I think is really easy to mess up, but I loved your approach to that. Well, you know, one of the things that I learned after the fact was, well, wine's very experiential. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, what's your favorite wine? Or mm -hmm. I, it's, not, it's not how it works for me. I don't sit down and take a sip of wine and say, all right, well, how does this compare to the uh, Chateau Margaux I had before? Wine's experiential, and, and the, the wines that I tend to remember, and most people tend to remember, are the ones when you were with some of your favorite people in the world, and you were in an, an amazing place, or you went to a concert, or you just had some great thing happen, and you remember that wine. You know, mm -hmm. Man, we were drinking, you know, we were drinking the 2010 Screaming Eagle, or whatever it was, and um, so when I would be in Texas or Virginia or North Carolina, 
the wines tasted really good. And, and some of the wines are really good. Mm-hmm. But then going back later, where they would send me the wines uh, out in California, you know, I realized that, okay, they've got a little ways to go before they're going to catch up to, to Sonoma or Napa or Oregon. But the beauty of it is that they're doing it. You mm-hmm. know, they make wine in every state in the U.S. So are the wines in Montana even... They're not even in the same, forget the same league. It's not even the same sport as yes. as the wines you're going to have in in the you know the key wine making regions of this country. But the fact that they're doing it and they're going to get it eventually, they're going to get it. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to start, and it's already happening. Like some places are further along than others, but um, that was was beautiful to me. You know, I, and so when I would sit in a winery in uh, Iowa, you know, I was in Des Moines, Iowa. Those wines tasted good to me. Because I was caught up in, I met the people that made it, and I heard the stories, you know, and especially in the Midwest where it's a big battle to uh, stay alive and not get gobbled up by large agri, you know, mm-hmm. uh, agricultural companies like Monsanto and, and, and uh, Canagra who want to buy up their farms, and and so these people are trying to figure out ways to make it, and for a lot of them, it's grapes. It's like, all right, well, maybe we can do this yeah. instead. Um, we can't keep up with them. We can't keep up with them in growing wheat and corn and whatnot, but we can we can we can do something different, mm-hmm. and that's the story you you get a lot, especially in the Midwest. and And to me, that's beautiful. I mean, it's 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 a great uh, and to see people that traditionally are not wine drinkers, mm-hmm. you know, hunkered down at the at the at the wine bar, um, enjoying a glass of Frontenac or Marquette or any of these hybrids that they grow out there in Brianna. Uh, it's it was eye-opening to me. When you started putting this project together and the road trip and, and so forth, is this book um, anything close to what you envisioned it turning out as? No. <laughs> you know, there's also some heartbreak in there. I'd gone through a breakup, and probably when I left, it was, it was a lot more about the breakup than it was about my brother. Uh, I, I, I didn't set out to write a book where I would that I would, think well at the end of this I'm going to take all these feelings and Mm -hmm. had and sort of work through them I didn't think about that you know I I didn't know I didn't know what the book was going to be necessarily I I mean I knew the nuts and bolts which was get in the car map the route visit wineries meet people get back and I had to write it quickly I had 95,000 words I think they wanted or 100,000 words in five six months which was crazy yeah. So I didn't have a whole lot of time to think about it. I mean, the book evolves. You know, you I, I there's so much stuff that I threw away. And you just have these little aha moments when you go, oh, so it's about this now. Yeah. You know, I see it moving in this direction. You, you said in Montana, that chapter about Montana, you can see as you get further along in the book, you'll see that I become less... Uh, I think I was feeling vulnerable from a relationship standpoint early mm-hmm. on, and you see that. So the relationship had ended, and so now I'm starting to question, you know, my my own sort of uh, virility, maybe. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> so in the Oregon chapter, which was early on, there's yeah. that moment with the waitress, and the, there's a, a moment in the book with a waitress at this restaurant in Oregon where I'm like sort of hitting on her, and mm-hmm. unbeknownst to me, the manager, it's her fiance. <laughs> um, and then in Montana, I check in, and there's another young, pretty girl at the thing. And <laughs> but I'm wondering, is she looking at me like as a potential partner? Or mm-hmm. Am I just one of the old guys that are? Can you curse on this show? Absolutely. Oh, okay. I'm like, am I just one of these old fuckers that are checking into this nice resort in Montana? Yeah. And she's just like, yes, yeah, being nice to me. And so you'll see that start to fall away as the book goes on, and yeah. it becomes less about that. And when I start, really, when I got back to Philadelphia in the book. Um, and I didn't, it, it wasn't conscious at the time, but I, it be, started to become more about uh, healing myself, the wounds from, that I felt from my brother dying, mm-hmm. and a lot less about my ego and, uh, and my ability to, uh, to sleep with women. <laughs> Hi, honey. Well, <laughs> I, I'm still almost kind of struggling to process it, and I haven't read the entire thing yet, but uh, based on my experience thus far, it is, it is my favorite beverage-related book period ever wow what is david wondrich gonna think when he hears this man i mean there's a lot of great writing out there but i feel like it transcends wine and it transcends 
beverage. And I've been a fan of your writing for a very long time. You used to I write used a to column write, for us. I used to write a column for you. At yeah. Mutineer. Yes. And uh, I know that you're very influenced by, by Hunter S. Thompson. And I think he can be a dangerous influence because his voice is so strong and it's so easy to emulate. And this book he, just feels like a perfect storm of taking everything that you've done as a writer and it just feels like a flow state. Oh, thank you. Man. It's just, it's, it's so dense, but so effortless and there's so much in there and it's so authentic to you, but it never feels sophomoric. It just feels real and authentic and it, it just feels alive. Uh, oh, see, I'm sorry. I wanted to be sophomoric there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm saving that up just for that moment. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. You know, and Hunter was a dangerous uh, guy to emulate when he was alive because he might shoot you. Yeah, but, I can uh, imagine. Now you don't have to worry about that anymore, but, um, I appreciate that. I mean, it's, um, I'm really happy with the way it turned out and, uh, we've been getting uh, great response and, and really the, the, you know, the part that's the, my favorite part of it is I've been meeting people along the way and I just say, Hey, just add me on Facebook and, and then you can shoot me a note and let me know. Cause they're reading the book. And I said, let me know what you think. I really want to, and people are taking me up on that. I'm getting a lot of notes from people that, that finished the book and, and, and everybody's, you know, I haven't had that happen. You know, my other books have been, have had my first book, Nobody Likes Quitter. I don't really love that book. And then Living Loaded did well, but that book was, Living Loaded was a, a problematic book for me because I was trying to be two things. I was trying to make it a cocktail book and a narrative at the same time. So I would, it was clunky and it didn't, you know, they, and then this one, I think we managed to do a nice job of, um, and I should mention my buddy, Scott Alexander, uh, my old editor, Playboy, was a big help with this book, too, and really helping me structure it and put it together. And, um, you know, we, I don't think there's ever moments where you get taken out of the narrative. I mm -hmm. have little sidebars in there about wine, but the wine, I think we pulled it off, managing to, to make it organic and natural and where it doesn't, you don't all of a sudden go, oh, boom, like it just stopped, like. He's talking about his bipolar mother, and then now he's talking about tasting notes. You know, so I think it worked. Obviously. It absolutely did. Yeah, I'm so, not even sure it's a book about wine. I mean, I know no. wine is the context and the setting, but it's so much bigger than that. Yeah, I like what uh, guy in Philly Weekly said. It was uh, "Eat, Pray, Love" meets uh, <laughs> "Sideways" while on the road. Yeah, that's good. I'll take that. I would take their sales numbers too for any of those books. <laughs> yeah. What do you think sold more books? E Pray Love were, well, On the Road has to have sold them so many copies. So right? many copies. Yeah, it, had, it has to, but they've all sold a lot of copies. Yeah. Side, Sideways is probably the least of those three, but mm -hmm. uh, that's a good book too. And for people in the industry, I also feel like there's this thing where you experience one side of the alcohol industry if you're a part of it, but what everyone else sees on the outside is completely different. And I feel like you managed to, to bring people into what it's really like to visit wineries and be out on the road and really be a part of this industry. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, it, I really enjoyed meeting all of these people and, and, you know, you, you pick up little things too, because, you know, essentially wine is made the same way and there's, you're going to hear a lot of the same things at every winery you go to, but you get, there's always that little thing that you didn't expect. So, for instance, when I was in Nebraska, mm -hmm. I went to a winery called Maletta Vista, Mick and Loretta McDowell. So get it, Maletta. Mm -hmm. Combine it. It's clever. They <laughs> they make a wine there called, um, well, the, the the varietal they use called Brianna, which is a white grape. It's a hybrid grape that they can grow there. And uh, do you know Chris Sawyer? Yeah. And so Chris turned me on to this. Chris Sawyer's of sommelier up in Sonoma area, Sonoma County, and very well known and knows his wine as much as anybody. And um, he told me about this wine because he had judged it. It was in a competition that he judged in Sonoma, and the wine did really well. Mm -hmm. So I go there, and I meet Mick and Loretta, and it's in St. Paul, Nebraska, which is... Um, St. Paul is right near uh, where the fuck am I and and <laughs> next to get me the fuck out of here. It's yeah. right there, right in the middle of those two places. So they, uh, I stayed at their house and um, so they had had a fire at the winery about two years before that and they built the whole thing back up again and it's looking great. So the first thing I said, I was talking to them about how do you manage to cultivate grapes out here? You know, it's a not an inhospitable place to, to grow, to make wine. And he said, well, you know, um, we took a lot of studying and, um, we've, you know, 
trial and error and whatnot. And of course, uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is always uh, here to help us. And I was like, right. I hadn't heard that before, right? You, <laughs> you don't hear that in Napa very often. So then a little while later, I said, um, and we were talking about the building the winery back up again. And I said, man, it's amazing. Like, how did you get this thing back? It just fire was a year and a half ago, and it's all built. And he said, well, it's a lot of hard work and you know, elbow grease and determination. And, of course, uh, Jesus is always watching over us. And I said, well, not always. <laughs> <laughs> Because he could have put the he could have blown that fire out. It's true. Yeah, yeah. And, and Mick laughed, and Loretta, I think, uh, was figuring I'm going to hell at that point. <laughs> they were both they were really sweet, and I stayed I stayed in their house, and that was you know so things like that. Those are memories where I never imagined I'd ever be in St. Paul, Nebraska, and I never imagined I'd be drinking wine there or staying in the winemakers, uh, you know, the couple that owns the winery's house, mm-hmm. and, and that was great, man. It was like people opened their doors to me and really made it a wonderful experience mm-hmm. that I then shit all over when I wrote the book. No. <laughs> I think I said nice things about them in there. When you reflect... This is good, by the way. What is this? This chocolate... Uh... Oh, the Westland. Man, no. What is it? What is it? Uh, Nika. Oh, the, the coffee. coffee malt? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is good stuff. Yeah, you can't it. even get that yet. It comes out oh. tails-ish, so I think June it's or July. me drinking it. Yeah. Um, it's like the only bottle. So wait. We're special. We are so special. Lucky me. (laughs) You've been in the trenches of of alcohol um, as a writer for a very long time now. When you think about your journey as a writer and reflect on that, how have you evolved? The trenches flow with vomit. No, uh, (laughs) tales of the cocktail. So, by the way, totally different environment here at Wine and Spirits Wholesalers, right? Than tales. What was the question again? I've been drinking. How have you evolved? Like, I mean, how how has your writing evolved and your connection with the industry and how you articulate Uh, it as a writer? Well, um, I think it's like anything else, man. You you do it long enough, you get better at it if you you stick with it. And, um, you know, it was great for me to get away from the cocktail writing for a while because I've been doing that for such a long time. But, uh, and I didn't know a lot about wine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Still don't. Uh, (laughs) But it was nice to sort of, get out there and uh i think there's a line early on in the book that says you know uh man let me find it uh, i can i can't say it as well as i say it in here um it was I, about, I already promised myself i wouldn't reference any bits from the book because i just hack them up to death it says uh oh that was kurt russell that was a fun part of the book wasn't it we that was to, awesome to hang out with kurt and oh yeah cool have fun <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading. I'm just catching. Oh, here it is. So it says, uh, you know, uh, raise the stakes a little. I called in a favor, got myself booked as a keynote speaker. We're talking about Pebble Beach Food and Wine. It says, if I didn't have my shit together by then, it would be glaringly, career-endingly obvious. The way I see it, what's the point of walking a tightrope if the fall won't kill you? <laughs> and that's kind of the idea behind the book was like, let me go out there. And, and when you talk about the evolution as a writer, so... You know, I wrote that column, The Imbiber, for a long time for mm-hmm. different publications, and it's an easy character to hide behind. Mm-hmm. You, know, you drink, and you, you fuck, and you go around, and you party with people, and you have an awesome time, and that's, your, that's the imbiber. Mm-hmm. And so when I set out, when I started to sit down and write this book, I, that was a decision that I made, was I'm leaving that. I'm not going to hide behind that. Um... You know, my brother drowned, my dad's an alcoholic, <clears throat> my mom's bipolar, my dog died of cancer, my dad, real dad lost his arm in an accident, this is all in the book, my stepdad, who raised me, died in a fire. <laughs> so I wrote in the book, it's just like the worst Lifetime movie ever, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and I was had a lot of apprehension about about writing that stuff, because I thought, well, this could just come across as a, just a maudlin weepy piece of shit and i was afraid of it i was i was afraid of my uh uh people not being able to connect with it or just being uninteresting but i had to i had to do it i had to write the most honest book i could write because i thought i've never done that before i've never really written honestly about life because i don't it's hard to do it and it's hard to hard to pull it off and so why do it if you can hide behind the character? But in this case, I went, no, I'm going to do that and see what happens. And hopefully 
uh, only half of you will think it's a weepy maudlin piece of shit, and the other half, like you, will like it. Once you made that commitment to that, buy approach, it anyway, though. Really, if you don't, I don't care if you don't like it. Just absolutely buy it. Yeah, buy it. Just buy it. Yeah. Once you made the decision to take that approach and you started the actual process of writing, did it come to you relatively easy? Um, it again. I got to credit Scott Alexander again here because I I work really well with him. He's very good at, at pulling stuff out of me and also um, forcing me to to work. <laughs> there were a lot of moments when he would say no. I'd send him something to look at and he'd shoot it back to me and go, no, mm-hmm. no, no. Fucking, dude, get at it. Like, get at it. Like, don't... Don't bullshit. Don't don't half ass this. Get in it. Get in it. Like reach in there and pull the guts out, man. Like get in and write it and say it and and don't worry about what you're saying and don't worry about how it's going to come across. He's like, I'll fix that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but just do it. Like get down as deep and dirty as you've ever gotten and do it. And don't and don't cheat yourself. And that was really what it came down to. Is when I look back at some of the stuff I wrote before, I think yeah, I I took shortcuts and I and I you know and it was I was thinking more about the end game you know i would think about oh what's it going to be like when the book comes out or what's that going to be like and and in this case i i didn't think about that all i thought about was uh was what's how's this chapter going to turn out and what's going to you know mm-hmm. how's it going to go and um and that was a great thing you know a lot of discovery for me in this book because you don't know i mean i don't know i don't know how other writers i can't speak for other writers in their process but a lot of this thing revealed itself to me as as i went along in mm-hmm. it you know and I, the ending of the book, uh, which I, I'm going to read now to give it away. No, I'm kidding. The end of the book, for instance, I didn't know is the end of the book. There's a, uh, uh, I started having this thing that I imagined about my brother uh, for a, a while and something that happened when I got back. And so I just sat down and I wrote that. And, it was, and in, normally when I write, I write a paragraph and then I read it. Mm-hmm. And then I write another paragraph and then I read both of those and so on and so on and extremely tedious way to work <laughs> in the case of the ending i just wrote it mm-hmm. and i just kept going and i bup, 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 hear that tapping uh and and then i read through it once and i thought oh this is pretty good you know and um it ended up becoming uh, wound up becoming the end of the book and that was exciting because I didn't know what the end was going to be. So, you know, it's almost like being a reader in some cases where you're like, Oh, how's this thing going to end? Yeah. It was like that for me writing it. How's it going to end? And, and then, and then of course, once I had that in place, then it was, it was a little bit easier to go back and, 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 you know, fill in the rest of the stuff. Yeah. It's, it's one thing to, to write it and, and finish writing it, but what's your experience been actually sharing it with people and putting it out into the world? Um, so far so good. I mean, it's only been a couple of weeks, but the events that we've done and the, and the, the readings and, uh, and people that have bought it and gotten back to me and, uh, response we're getting a little bit of response in Hollywood stuff. Uh, it's great and exceeded. Couldn't, couldn't be better. Really mm-hmm. couldn't be. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled with how it turned out and that people are connecting. Although, it's funny, uh, one of the first review, the very first review that I read, I won't say which publication it is, but it was kind of, it was kind of a crappy review and, you know, you try not to take these things to heart and I, now they'd reviewed this particular publication and reviewed my other books and, and so I read it and I was like, God damn it, <laughs> right? Like, can't they, and then I got another review and this was like a, from a blog and uh, I say that like I'm spitting it out from a blog. I like bloggers. but uh, <laughs> And this is a guy that I knew. And so he was excited to read the book. And then he, he read the book. And then he wrote me a note. And he said, oh, man, I just posted something. you got to read it. Check it out. And, and I read it. And it was, at best, it was full of backhanded compliments. You know? <laughs> and I thought, um, and I, my, I mean, my girlfriend read it. And she, she said, I said, am I missing, I mean, is this me or am I taking this? And she said, no, no, it's it's really kind of not great what he's saying. And I was like, all right, because, you know, you, I need other people to tell me, am I being nuts here? Am I being, mm-hmm. Because he seemed to be excited for me to read this thing. Like he was like, the guy was going to go, hey, man, thanks. 
and I didn't like it. So those were the first two, and I was thinking, and there was a moment when I thought, did I, did I miss the, did I miss the mark here? Because I had let other people read the book, and 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 uh, and I would get, but in terms of from a critical response, I thought, then maybe I, maybe I didn't do it. You know, like when the first two are not what you think. Yeah. But then we started getting good ones, and so the point being is, fuck those guys. Absolutely. Dumb fucks. <laughs> Stupid assholes. I'm kidding. <laughs> not really. I don't like them. Um, that's why I'm not going to name them. Okay. Alan's, Alan's worried now. No. <laughs> it's this It's this whiskey. It's the whiskey. It's the yeah, new coffee malt. It's starting to do it to me. You've been in this industry for a very long time. You've been Are very... you trying to call me old? No, absolutely right. not. Christ. You do that to yourself in the book. I don't why is everybody to. insulting me? <laughs> yeah. What and you're here at WSWA, you I know, am. shaking hands, getting getting involved. What still inspires you about this culture and this industry? You know, man, it's funny. Like I said, I got out of it for a while, and I was doing the wine, and I I I told uh, Scott again, Scott Alexander, I told him, I called him, I said, you know, man, it's good to be back. Mm -hmm. I miss this. I miss the spirits world, and mm -hmm. I miss uh, the people. And I've got a couple of things coming up soon. I can't necessarily talk about them yet because they haven't been announced. But I'm going to be getting back into doing some more, uh, getting back and doing the Imbiber column again. <laughs> I get to hide behind that character once again. Yes. <laughs> I laid it all out there. I threw my nuts on the table, and uh, now I'm putting them back in. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I'm excited to get back into, into writing about spirits. It's a, such a fun world, you know, and, and the people are great. And, um I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm excited to, I've been doing this a long time. I started the very first trip that I ever went on, uh, was in 1999 and it was over to Turin, Italy. And we went over for the international flair bartending competition. <laughs> and it was me and Gary Regan and Gary's then wife, Marty and Dale DeGroff and, uh, my buddy Terry Sullivan, who used to write the mixology column for GQ. And so we're in Turin, and this is flair bartending. This is, you know, cocktail. Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise throwing the bottles up. Yeah. There. So then we go out the one night in Turin, and Dale, uh, and for those who don't know, Dale DeGroff is, you know, a huge, like, one of the most influential people in, in, you could argue, the most famous bartender in the world, and probably wouldn't get many arguments back. But so Dale and I are, and, and Terry, we're all out, and Dale's tasting me through different Amaro, and, and, uh, <coughs> Sorry, stop work again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's this beer. It's the beer or the whiskey. Hold on. It's a combination. Mm. So we're tasting through this stuff. And Dale saying to me, um, yeah, man, this is all coming back. Like we're, it's going to happen in the U.S. and the States. And, and we were drinking, you know, we maybe we had some Negronis or some old fashions or uh, uh, I think there might have been a blood and sand in there at some point. And I was looking at Dale like he had three heads going, you think so? <laughs> Do you think this is going to happen? Because at that time, everybody's drinking, you know, uh, tequila sunrises and sex on the beach and Alabama slammers. Uh, and he says, yeah, no, man, this, it's coming. This, this, it's coming back. Well, and, and, it, and obviously he was wrong. No, joking. He was never wrong. <laughs> and so it was great, man. It was great to be in that really early on and, and to be part of that and to go like to the tales and the beginning and, and all these things. And then and I probably burned out on it. Yeah, not probably. I did burn out on it, and uh, but now I'm I'm unburnt. I'm mm -hmm. back. I'm freshly risen from the ashes, like the phoenix. How's that? <laughs> wow! Can I have some more whiskey? Absolutely. Yeah. I know a guy. Uh, I got two more questions for you. Okay. Um, Make them good. You know, going back to Hunter S. Thompson and and how influential he was to you. Uh, it, it must be you know sad that you're unable to share this book <laughs> with him at this I stage. was sad that I couldn't get him to give me a blurb for the jazz. Like, <laughs> man, that would have been a great one. Um, by the way, we have some good blurbs here. We've you really do. Joel Stein from Time Magazine, Adam Carolla, um, Curtis Stone, Chef, Allison Janney, Maynard James Keenan, the you go. singer of Tool, no Hunter S. Thompson. Thanks, Hunter. I know, right? Asshole. Um, would, I would you know, I would like to hit him to have read this book. Yeah, I don't know about the other ones. This one, I think he would have uh, he would have been cool with this one. And uh, you know, I'm still friends with Anita, his widow, and and uh, she's fantastic. And you know, Hunter, the relationship I had with him was was uh, interesting. Uh, loved him, and uh, I think he loved me to to agree as much as he could, and uh, much as he was capable of. Um, 
but he, he had the same thing problem with me. I think that Scott had, you know, he used to yell at me and this is, you know, I was in my twenties then and he would tell, I was lazy and maybe that I had like a, a natural sort of ability to write, but I didn't work at it. And, and he was right. He was absolutely right. And so I would like to think that in this book, he would maybe concede that I worked at it and, and put in the time and the effort to, to do something that doesn't embarrass me. <laughs> so yeah, that's, I got, you know, I got the tattoo there, the Hunter Thompson tattoo on the arm. There it is. Yeah, just so people know I'm cool. And lastly, you've done so much work um, within this industry and culture. Oh, I have. Yes. And Thank I you. Thank fully you for expect uh, that you'll put out much, much more great work. But at this stage of the game, what does success look like for you? And what do you kind of hope your legacy is in terms of your contribution to the culture? Um, what does success look like for me? I don't know, man. I have a hard time uh, ever feeling good about that. And I, but that's a both a blessing and a curse. You know, I never think to myself, um, uh, there's this thing I mentioned in the book, imposter syndrome. I talk about that where people who are successful don't believe that they, they, uh, they deserve it at all. And, and the reason I know about imposter syndrome is I looked it up because I would always feel that way. I'd be like, ah, why, what's wrong with me? Like, why can't, when something happens almost, you know, universally I'll, I'll, I'll think, Instead of going, oh my God, this was so great. Uh, I was on, uh, I was on Conan, you know, which I was a couple years ago. Instead of going, wow, I was on Conan, I'd be like, wow, I was only. I, I did an eight-minute segment on Conan, which is really mm -hmm. big. I would think, oh, why did I wear that shirt on Conan? <laughs> like, look what I, what was I thinking? Like, how did I fuck this up? And. So it tends to be the case a lot. So I'm trying to get over that as I get, you know, as I get older, I'm trying to look at it and think, um, you know, is this on the New York Times bestseller list? No, not yet, but it's doing okay. And people like it and we're digging it. And um, then trying to pat myself on the back every once in a while. And then uh, moving forward, I, I, I would hope to do another book. Not yet. I need a little break. <laughs> um, what I'm hoping happens is that Steven Spielberg options this mm -hmm. and they make it into an epic blockbuster starring Chris what's that guy's name Pratt that guy yeah he's a he's a he's you cast yourself now. he's out yeah he's gonna play me yeah. yeah Chris Pratt if you're out there God the job is yours my friend it's all <laughs> yours yeah so but yeah, yeah man I honestly the truth of it is like I'm looking forward to getting back to uh once this is done for a while, I'm looking forward to getting back to, you know, some of these exciting things that I have coming up in terms of writing stuff and just getting it back out there. I've been doing stuff for, for Thrillist in LA and uh, really getting great response to those columns and that feels good again. Mm -hmm. to, like I've written a couple pieces there that have, that have gotten tons of traffic and and I like that. I like, I miss that part of it, writing the, you know, stuff that makes people you know, either want to hug you or punch you in the face. <laughs> I, you know, I was missing that. And you don't get that on a book. I mean, it's a long slog. You know, mm -hmm. So now I'm kind of looking forward to getting back to just doing boom, 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 like every week a new column and, and have people write horrible things about me on the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have so much to be proud of. And thank you so much for writing this book and, and contributing it to the culture because I think it's a, a very important contribution and just reflects your, your real talent as a writer. And I'm just, I'm enjoying the hell out of reading it and I can't wait to finish it. Thanks, man. By the way, it, it is called American Wino. <laughs> <laughs> Tale of reds, whites, and one man's blues. And uh, if you buy it and you add me on Facebook, I'll... Uh, be your new friend and that's how it goes down really too not just a facebook friend a legit friend game on cut that part out will you all yeah. right no i don't want any more facebook friends get the book please damn it you should your thanks for having me man this has been it. really fun this is great and I, I like what you got going on here and uh, it's good to see that you've uh you've uh finally made something of yourself because i was worried about you i know yeah it's exciting huh yeah it's, it's good stuff man you're married now you're, i know you're like a it's like a real adult. I know it's looking that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. You have to. I'm gonna get some tips from you on how to make that work. There we go. Real adulthood. I got your back. Until next time.